Hey there, and welcome to Large Format Friday. I'm your host, Matt Mirage. If this is the first time you're stopping by the channel, there's a playlist of our entire third season of LFF. And if you haven't subscribed yet, each and every Friday, we're gonna be here and we're gonna be chatting about something large format. Today, I'm in my buddy Tariq Terry's studio. If you've been a follower of the channel since the first season, you may have seen this place a couple of times, especially when we did our eight by 10 Polaroid episode, which, ah, oh, can't wait to shoot instant again. But anyway, I'm here in the studio today because I wanted a place to kind of set things up, including some lighting, and practice a little bit of large format macro photography. Let's get settled in and chat more about it. So one of the great things about being in a studio space like we have here at Tariq's is it's just nice, open, there's some great natural light coming in, but we also have some professional continuous and strobe lighting at our disposal. It's a really good idea to have some factors controlled when you're doing something you've never attempted before. For me today, that's working here in the studio with large format macro photography. This is the Nikkor AMED 120 millimeter f5.6. Came into work a couple weeks back and I thought of it being the perfect opportunity to talk about large format macro because this is a macro specialty lens. Now you can do large format macro photography with a variety of lenses, uh, from barrel lenses to process lenses to pictorial and just standard use lenses. I think where macro photography really shines is when you use something that's dedicated for it, just like when working with 35 millimeter in medium format. In roll film formats, we could use extension tubes to pull that lens further away. We could use bellows, and we could even use a reversing ring where we re reverse the elements of the lens. What's really interesting about a lens like this one, it's at its best when you're doing a one-to-one -one ratio, which means you're reproducing the subject on your imaging plane at the exact size. Our biggest hurdle in working with macro photography is going to be bellows. I'm gonna keep bringing that up because bellows are crucial to what we're doing in today's episode. We're gonna be running into a lot of that bellows extension factor. So let's get the studio prepped for some shooting. I'm gonna use this backdrop behind me. I'm gonna add on some lighting and then we're gonna to get to it. So I got my backdrop and my lights in position. Now let's talk subject matter. I got some fresh, uh, fresh veggies right from the home garden. This is mine and Lauren's first year doing our raised beds. And I'll tell you, they are producing quite a bit. Carrots are definitely a little funky. Tomatoes are on fire. I even got these little black cherry tomatoes. I got a little, these little neat, neat little vines at the top. I even got some little jalapenos. The natural light that's coming in is great, but it's not going to be enough to give me the shorter exposures and far less reciprocity than I want to work with. So I've got some lighting set up here. I've got this big continuous light here. And when I turn that on, this is going to be my key light or my main light source. Once that powers up, uh, you're going to see, oh yeah. And it's just coming in at a little bit of an angle and this is going to help us work with texture. Now that light falls off pretty quickly and creates some shadows. I want to give some extra dimensionality to these. So I've got another light um, off to camera right here. And that's just giving me a little bit of a highlight and it's also illuminating our background. And that's going to be it. Really, really keep it simple with this. It's all about uh, the shapes and the subject matter. I want to dive a little bit more into this really unique macro specialty lens. This is the Nikkor AMED 120 millimeter f5.6. AMED, so AM is APO macro, apochromatic meaning it is going to be a modern coated lens that's going to handle uh, any sort of spherical and chromatic aberrations that are going on. So stuff's going to look like it should without any of that weird color fringing or softening, especially when we're up close because it's a macro specialty lens too. This lens is optimized for one-to-one -one magnification, but can go well beyond that. The f-stop isn't going to matter too much because to get maximum coverage out of this lens, we're going to need to be near f22. And generally speaking, when we're doing macro photography with these type of lenses, we're going to have those bellows drawn way far out and start dealing with bellows extension factor. We'll get We'll get more to that once we've got the camera set up. I chose this lens specifically because it's a macro specialty lens. I could get there with standard lenses or process lenses, which are also optimized for up close work. But this one is about as modern, uh, modern and corrected as you get. The way I'm going to start using this is I'm going to get my 8x10 Takahara set up and I'm going to use my 8x10 reducing back. So this is going to allow me to shoot 4x5 film because this lens 
at infinity to near one-to-one -one focus. It's gonna be great for four by five and at one-to-one, -one, it's also gonna work really well for five by seven. The cool thing though, is once we get beyond two to one magnification, so double life size, I'm gonna be able to use this all the way on eight by 10 inch film. So we're gonna work our way up and I'll try to talk you through uh, my, my thoughts and my approach to it along the way. Focusing this is, well, it's gonna be tricky because we're so, so, so close. Whenever you're doing macro uh, and close up work, your depth of field is going to shrink significantly. The closer we're getting to our subject, the shallower the depth of field is gonna be, no matter uh, what type of lens, macro, specialty or not. One unique thing about large format cameras is we have the ability to rack out the bellows as far as we need to to make the shot happen. And I've got my bellows extended about 250 millimeters. Now, for a 120 millimeter lens, if I want to reproduce these little tomatoes one-to-one -one on my ground glass, I need to have double the focal length in bellows. That's gonna make these tomatoes appear on the ground glass about life size. One way to measure our bellows extension factor is a cloth tape. This was featured quite a few months back in one of my pieces of large format fluff. Bought this at a sewing supply store. I think these are like three bucks. Let's see. Yeah, we are at 255 millimeters of extension, which is more than double the focal length of the lens, meaning we're gonna have to compensate by two whole f-stops. If you wanna learn more about bellows extension factor, I'm gonna put a link up here to the bellows extension factor video, but this is one great way to measure it. Another way we can measure bellows extension factor is through the use of a little extension factor tool. This is the Cinar pen. It's actually a pencil, but it's got this hexagonal cap in it, and this is meant to go in the scene where your subject is, so we'll place it right there, and it's measured on the ground glass against this little chart. It tells us our bellows extension factor on one side, and if I flip it around, it tells me how many f-stops I need to compensate. Okay, so yep, we are just like our bellows extension factor from measurement told us, our CNR pen is telling us we need to compensate with two whole f-stops. So no matter what we meter for our time, we're gonna have to add two f-stops for bellows extension factor. Our metered exposure for F22 with our bellows extension factor of two stops making our effective F-stop F45, we are going to have a total exposure time with reciprocity failure of two and a half seconds. I could be shortening this exposure by using strobes, but I haven't talked about strobes on the channel and constant light is, well, it's exactly what you're seeing. We're shooting Ilford Delta 100, the stuff that we've tested on the channel and we've been working with for the last few months, might as well keep it consistent. So I'm going to take out my film. Ready, and 1,001, 1,002, 1,000. Next up, we have these really gnarly carrots fresh from the garden. Now I'm using my field camera, which isn't optimal for studio work. I should be using a monorail, but the CNR would have taken a lot of work to haul in here today, so I didn't. What's really helping me focus macro for this though, is the ability for my tripod head having this geared motion, I can move it up and down. And now I'm definitely gonna have to get back under the dark cloth because uh, there's no way it's in focus again. And the other precise thing that's nice is the quick release adapter. This is my Nova Flex Q equals base. This is interesting because it allows me to shift the entire assembly. Now it's not as it's not like a geared macro plate, but it allows me to slide the plate without fear that the whole assembly is going to fall off. So I can slide this closer and further and lock it down. So it's in position, but it's physically moving closer and further, which can really, really help. Right. For this composition, I am applying a little bit of movements. I'm tilted all the way forward. And then I also have just a little bit of standard tilt to try and get this plane right here on the top of these carrots in nice sharp focus. And then I am applying just a little bit 
of tilt. I'm not using it as a correction, but more to exaggerate the wild shapes that I'm getting. Remember, our front standard controls our plane of sharp focus. And this one, while it can control focus, our rear standard also can change the shape because it's changing the distance uh, those rays of light have to make to hit the ground glass. Metering is gonna be nearly identical. My bellows extension isn't quite as far, so instead of F22, I'm at F22 and a third, but everything else is going to stay the same. Now, I can get lazy about this in the field, but when we're doing something as precise as macro, you wanna make sure every single one of your movements are locked down to the best of your ability. This is really gonna make sure that it's as sharp as we want it to be. We'll load up the second shot. Make sure we're there, good. Open. And, 1001, 1002, 1000. Great. Fun fact, if you're doing large format photography and you're doing close-ups, you're legally obligated to shoot peppers. The more sexual it looks, the better. So I'm really, really up close. Uh, we are now well beyond a one-to-one. -one. I'm gonna redo my bellows extension factor. We are at 310 millimeters, which is nearly triple the focal length. So with our bellows extension factor at three f-stops of compensation, we have our, our f-stop on the lens still at f22, same lighting. I've brought in this fill instead of the, uh, the backlight. Uh, this little reflective bit is gonna come in and just pop in enough light without having a harsh specular highlight on the side. And now my exposure metered time is four seconds with my reciprocity failure. I'll take four to the 1.26 like we talked about in previous episodes, and that's gonna give me six seconds of exposure. So gotta have everything really, really, really locked down. Make sure it's not going anywhere. All right, everything's set and locked down. Okay. Ready, and thousand one. So I changed out to this more colorful pepper. I backed my camera away and my focus is back to two f-stops of compensation instead of three. So we're back to that three-ish second exposure instead of six. Ready and? For this last shot, I've got set up here, kind of the wide, get everything in there. I don't have near as much bellows extension factor because I'm backing up and I'm trying to get a wider perspective. So instead of having the two stops or three stops of bellow extension factor that I had before, I'm just shy of 180 millimeters of bellows draw. This is a 120 millimeter lens. 120 to 180, that's 60. One rule of thumb I've used for years and years, for every 50% of the focal length, go ahead and add one f-stop for bellows extension factor. We are now going to be doing f22 at one second. Okay, insert our slide. Ready, and. Now, if you spend too much time reading data sheets and all that stuff on your lens, uh, you might be scared to try your macro lens, which is made for one format, on something larger. This little Nikkor, even though it doesn't look like a lot, once we get beyond our one-to-one -one extension, we're gonna be able to cover all the way up to eight by 10. This is a lens that um, on Nikon's data sheet, it says the image circle at F22 is 250 millimeters. That's still short of what we need for eight by 10, but as soon as we start magnifying, as long as we've got the bellows to pull that out further and further, we're gonna be able to cover eight by 10, but we're gonna be talking really, really close up pictures. 
So another reason I know that this lens will cover up to 8x10 is because I was playing around with it uh, a couple days ago when I first brought the lens home. And I wanted to see, you know, can I just go super, super close? Even though all the forums say you can't, looks great. I had some cool backlight in the evening and I photographed this, uh, uh, this neat, little, neat little flower bud. So while I'm messing around with focus here with my, uh, with my final shot, this is a great time to go ahead and thank all of our LFF sustaining members. We're on our fourth month of the program now, and it's, uh, it's viewer support like yours that allows me to keep doing what I'm doing, uh, throw film through here, uh, take the time to set up the studio and do all this stuff. So hopefully you guys can get something out of it. If you wanna learn more about becoming an LFF sustaining member, uh, you can head over to mirage.com slash memberships for more information. It starts at a dollar a month uh, with perks at the $5 and $10 level. So check it out and thanks. The one thing about tabletop that I'm still not used to is I get to meticulously place everything. It's not like nature where you just kind of find it and move the camera around. Ground glass to lens. Oh, we are just shy of 300 millimeters. Stop our lens down to the aperture we want it to. Now for this one, I am gonna go up a little bit more. I am at F32 this time around. All right. Ready, and. So before we head on out today, I wanted to offer a few more tidbits about large format macro photography. Even though I was using a macro specialty lens today, that Nikkor 120, you don't necessarily need a dedicated macro lens. It definitely helps though, especially for those one to one, two to one, maybe even three, four to one type magnifications. But this does lead us to a specific type of macro lens, uh, like some of the earlier Rodenstock and Schneider macro lenses. Those were good at one to three and three to one. And they would actually instruct you to reverse uh, the order of the lens. So uh, the back rear group element would be facing towards your subject and the front group would be facing toward the camera in order for you to get a closer and more optimized macro range. That's pretty cool stuff. Um, now, I prefer the dedicated macro lens because I didn't have to mess around like that and I didn't have to rack out my bellows super, super, super long when using uh, my process lens here, which is the G Clairon. This one's good for close-up because it's a process lens. It was meant for copying artwork. The only downside is I would need a whole heck of a lot of bellows. A one-to-one -one on a 355 millimeter lens is double the focal length, that's 700 millimeters. That's why I really preferred using this shorter focal length. So if you're looking to do large format macro photography, I recommend starting in the 120 millimeter to 180 millimeter range if you're working in four x five and five x seven and consider for five by seven and larger, 120, 180, and then there are also uh, 210 millimeter and 300 millimeter macro lenses. If you go any longer than that, you're just gonna get into like absurd amounts of bellow draw and it might not be worth it. If you have any questions about the large format macro process, go ahead and drop those down below in the comments and let me know what you thought. I don't do a lot of studio and still life photography. I'm sure I've got a lot of work to do ahead of me, but it was a lot of fun constructing something and really just kind of being in control of everything. That was really nice. For all those long form questions, you can always feel free to shoot me an email, largeformatquestions at gmail.com. Thanks again for stopping by and we'll catch you next week for more LFF.